evening and welcome to the last uh, Zoom conference uh, for the 2022 year. And uh, it is a, a delight um, <clears throat> to have Bruce Wistance with us this evening. And I'm happy so many people have registered and are checking in um, for this event. I want to start off, though, by uh, thanking the committee that has worked with me this year again um, to put these uh, conferences on. Uh, and that is Audrey Klinkenberg, who is the town of Saugerties historian and the president of the Ulster County Ge Genealogical Society, Gail Manny, the uh, town of Marbletown historian, Susan Stesson Cohen, who is the New Paltz historian, Marnie Jansen, who's the um, vice president of the Ulster County Ge Genealogical Society, Richard he Hepter, who's the Woodstock historian, uh, Joan Kelly, who's the historian for the town of Lloyd, Susan Sprackman, <clears throat> who's the Ulster County Historical Society tre treasurer, Pamela Herrick, who's the director of the Ulster County Hi Historical Society, who will be taking the place of the retiring or the retired uh, di director of, the, of that in institution, uh, Su Suzanne, uh, this is what I mean about going off, off script, Suzanne ha Hausberg. Um, and I also definitely want to thank Karen Le Levine, who has run all of the conferences for us and has run many conferences that I have been to over the last few years. I've known Karen for a lot of years and uh, <clears throat> she does a great job. It's always a very smooth kind of an operation. Um, for me as a historian, um, I have always been most excited when I've come across a diary or family correspondence are things that put a human touch on what it is I'm studying so that I can get beyond the pieces, you know, the pieces of paper, the census data, the uh, background information that I know and get into the specifics of the community or the thing that I'm working on in a very personal way. So I was uh, thrilled when uh, Gail Manny suggested Bruce Wistance as a possible speaker for the last conference here, and uh, because he's been involved in writing memoirs over the last, um, Bruce, I forget, is it one or two years um, where you've been writing uh, one, one a week or something? Well, it started in... Thanksgiving of 2021, thinking I was going to do one a week through the winter while I couldn't work out in the garden landscaping and, oh, and okay. I ended up uh, keeping on. Yeah. But, you know, the the thing I really loved was uh, when it, I've read diaries and letters from the 19th century, which is my specialty, but it was interesting to read memoirs of someone who's roughly my own age. I think he's a year or two younger than I am, but we lived through the same period. So a lot of the memoirs that he wrote uh, that about his life touched on things that were part of my life too. So it's it's, it's been an interesting experience for me get, getting to know Bruce. And it even started with the song I asked, what song would you like us to put on while we're waiting. And that Lindsey B Buckingham song was one of my favorites. Uh, uh, you know, the first time I heard it, I worked it out on the guitar and I would play it. So it's, um, <clears throat> that's that's the way his me memoirs have, have gone for me. It was like an opportunity for me to get back in touch with my life at a particular point in time when due to the pandemic and all of that, I've been looking backward, you know, uh, and seeing, you know, what I've gone through, the the changes I've done, and 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 so uh, so Bruce's accounts were were wonderful for for that. But in in thinking about what what I wanted to say here at the beginning here is I I remember in the middle of the pandemic, 
getting a directive from uh, the state history office to collect stories from people, uh, their COVID stories. And it was sent out across the whole state that uh, individual localities were supposed to start to collect people's stories. And I was thinking, what a phenomenal thing. I didn't do it for here because to tell you the truth, I was off my game, locked in my house, afraid to go out, you know, not knowing how to in those early days. And so I never got a handle on starting it up for here. But think of what a treasure trove that'll be down the road when we sit down and try to figure out what the impact of the pandemic really was beyond the effects on the uh, gross national product and all of that. But we sit down and we say, what what were the human consequences of, of this whole thing? And we have a chance to find out about it from many different uh, people, um, different political orientations, different backgrounds, different careers, professions. And then you put this whole thing together and you start to get an idea of the complexity. So um, for me, memoir, uh, I think I'm gonna follow um, Br Bruce's lead and start to try to write memoirs here and leave them to my kids, you know, and yeah. to, for the next generation of people to understand what this place was from my perspective. So, okay, so without further collaborate on my part, I'm going to turn this evening over to uh, Bruce Wistance. Yeah, just to just to comment on that, it seems like writing memoir is sort of like birds feeding. I mean, when people see uh, how intriguing some of these narratives are they're inspired to write narratives from their own life and that i've seen that happen with the responses to my stories but uh, the way this all got started uh i took creative writing in college and uh we had to write at least one piece in each genre and i would have flunked if they were all uh, uh plays because I just could not write a, a decent play. We had to keep writing one until we passed. And so I finally passed with plays. But uh, what I really enjoyed was short stories. And memoir was not an option because as, a, as young students, we really didn't have enough life experience to write interesting memoirs. But uh, I had a lot of fun writing short stories for uh, school newspapers and just fun when I was uh, writing my other papers. And in my career, I ended up writing a lot of uh, technical specifications and technical papers and disclosures and things like that. And uh, when I wanted to take a break from that, I was advised by other writers that I needed remediation from my years of technical writing, that, that it was too technical for, for literary uh, purposes. So. Uh, I took a course uh, about four or five years ago at uh, Delhi University. It was a writer's workshop, writing your spiritual memoir. And just like the young people that go to a music teacher and say, I only want to learn Stairway to Heaven. I don't want to learn scales. I don't want to learn any of the songs. Just teach me to play Stairway to Heaven. That's all I want to spend time learning. So I just wanted to write a story about a uh, very dramatic experience I had where I was literally hanging off a cliff. And for those of you who have read my memoirs, it's, it's a point in time. And I expanded on that point in time of actually hanging off the cliff to provide some uh, some background of my life leading up to that and what I was to, to kind of put a context around what was going in my mind when I was hanging off there and then what happened after I didn't die, as you see here, I didn't fall off the cliff. So uh, just like the kids that go to learn Stairway to Heaven, by the time they've learned Stairway to Heaven, they've learned a lot of other songs. I ended up writing a lot of uh, a lot of memoirs, and uh, they were a lot of fun to do. So last Thanksgiving, I started writing one a week, and I thought I would post it on Facebook for my friends. And... Uh, they would, you know, for a few months, and then I'd go back to 
everything else. And uh, they were really well received. And then this this April, I got the bad news that I had advanced pancreatic cancer. So my priorities changed and my family helped me with those priorities. <laughs> and they really wanted me to write some things up, uh, uh, stories that I had told that I hadn't written up. And they said, well, my son said, dad, you got to write up the story about how your, your social science club took over the administration building the day that the Kent uh, state massacre happened. You got to write that up. So, so they would give me assignments to write up these stories. And uh, so I, I've been continuing. And what's ended up happening is for, for historians, you know, that you, you get a batch of photographs and you try to keep it in context based on where they came from to understand what you've got and who these people are in the scenes in there. And unfortunately, people don't always put inscriptions on these old photos. Even uh, from my own family, I have uh, shoe boxes uh, and bins of photographs that are not inscribed and they need to be gone through. So if only somebody had taken those images and written up memoir about those images, it, it, it would really add to the historical record and, and really make understanding history, make, make history come alive. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of history that comes from uh, deeds and, and mortgages and, and, and official county records, but it doesn't tell you how people's lives were affected, how they felt and things. So it, it's, it, it's, it's like uh, uh, the, the ultimate uh, caption to, to have a, a memoir enhanced by images so that you can uh, understand what's going on in, in those images. So I, what also comes to mind is I helped the town historian in Hurley, which is Doreen Like, but the previous town historian, the current one is Jim Decker, who's been very helpful in some of my memoirs. But Doreen and I were doing a project with uh, oral history. And many times we would interview different people and would ask them about the same events and ex experiences. And we would get entirely different views of what had happened. Now these are uh, you know, firsthand experiences of, of an event from two different points of view and you, you get different information. So even having one memoir is not enough. So pe more people have to write memoirs <laughs> so, so that, that you could comport some against each other and, and, and try to get a sense of what really happened. So that, that really was in my mind when I was uh, writing some of these. And, and, and what happened here is I would write a standalone story about dramatic event that would make it exciting and interesting to read. So it's sort of a, sort of a story centric approach to memoir. And it would be image rich because I would seek out images. And before I would even start on a memoir, I'd make sure I had enough images to illustrate the story. And, and sometimes that's not possible. And I'll, I'll talk a little about that. I have a few uh, slides to run through later to talk to you about that. But uh, what's really come out of this was, and it was unexpected to me is that uh, probably because of the, my age and, and similar age of a lot of my readers, a lot of the elements of the stories really resonated with people. And, and, and things have changed a lot and you don't see things anymore like we used to when we were younger. And, and I, I tried to uh, capture the feeling of those, those bygone things in my, my stories. And that has really come out in the, the responses I've got from people. So if only we had contemporaneous records of uh, civil war, soldiers or, or you know, colonial uh, colonists and, 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 and the, the 
loyalists, you know, if we only had a record of what they were really feeling and what they saw and what they experienced, it certainly really helped the, uh, the historical record. So one thing I thought of is, uh, you know, the father of history is Herodotus from the fifth century BC. But many, be, pe many people called him the father of lies, not the father of history, because people couldn't believe all these stories he had. They were just so outrageous. But now, over time, it's been seen that uh, historians and archaeologists have supported what he, he said, these unbelievable stories that people called him a liar about because people just couldn't believe it. Now, a lot of the things that have happened to me are kind of unbelievable I, because of my unconventional lifestyle and grew up in antiques business and uh, full time and worked my way through college, had a lot of different jobs. I had a lot of different unusual experiences. And uh, I was afraid people were going to say, I call BS. You know, too many things <laughs> that this, all these things couldn't happen to one person. It must be fiction. But what's borne out in the responses. And, and as I would put them on, up on Facebook, people that had also experienced these, many times I didn't know they, they had similar experiences. They would say, oh yeah, that happened to me. Or yeah, I remember that. That's so, so my wife said, yeah, you're not making this stuff up. You know, people are saying, people are saying they remember this. So that, that's been a kind of a, a validation of, uh, of, of this, this project of writing these memoirs. So how the, the book came to be. I didn't know I was writing a book. I just thought I was having fun writing a post a week for, for Facebook. But uh, Carl and uh, Jane Mendel from uh, the, the Bruderhof community were active in a group that I, I am also an act, act where I was active. I kind of backed off in this, this last spring with uh, the Kingston High School class of 1967 reunion committee and planning reunions. And, and they were seeing these stories and they said, well, Bruce, uh, would you, how would you like it if we published a book of your memoirs? And we'll print it and you can give copies to your family and friends. We'll do a short run, do enough to, you know, for your family and everything. And uh, I said, yeah, sure. And it sounds like a great idea. And Jane said, well, can you put them in chronological order? And my first thought was, well, they span intervals of time and, and, and some aren't necessarily one specific time that you put in chronological order. But she did a cut and it ended up being a beautiful job. She's brilliant. And she realized there was a missing element of uh, a missing story about how my wife and I met. And I wrote that up and put that in there. And it kind of makes it a coherent uh, timeline of, uh, of, a, of a lifetime of crazy things happening <laughs> if you've read these memoirs. So, uh, there were 43 written at the publication cutoff, and I've since finished enough to make a total of 63. And uh, I didn't know I was writing a book, so I wasn't really rigorous with the the uh, photo credits. And uh, I, a lot of the images, luckily, are, are my own that I took or my family took, and or, or photographers were generous enough to give me credit to use them. But a lot of them I had to find photograph that would help illustrate a story and that don't have the, the, uh, the permission to use it in a commercial uh, project. So there's also been a lot of uh, recommendations. I tend to know a lot of writers and lots, some writers have told me, uh, you should really publish this in a, with a commercial imprint in a big publishing house. And I looked into that a little bit, and uh, uh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> Lowell Thing, who's the uh, author that wrote uh, The Street That uh, Built the City, has been very helpful. And he took my, my manuscript to uh, the, the book that the Bruder have published to Black Dome Press, and they liked it and said that they would uh, uh, endorse it with another publisher. but. Uh, Publishers tend not to want to do a uh, memoir book. They don't sell well, and they they tend to want to. And unless you're uh, Prince Harry and you're writing uh, Spare, 
<laughs> people will buy your <laughs> book of memoirs. But uh, in, in general, big publishing houses don't do uh, memoirs. So I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. But uh, the uh, Bruderhof did a beautiful job in, uh, in, in putting together this short run for my uh, family and friends. And what's really happened here, there's been a tremendous amount of positivity that's come out of the responses and, and the reconnection with old friends and uh, and making of new friends. Yeah, my wife's telling me I'm got to speed it up here. So uh, I saw my doctor this week and he said, well, there's no doubt about it, that the kind of thing that positivity is improving your health, keep writing. So I'm continuing to write. So I want to take you through some uh, some images just to sort of to share the screen here if I can. And uh, I'll do a little uh, ex ex expansion on some of the stories if, if you've read them. This is the cover of the book. I assume this is working good. So yes, uh, yes. Yeah. I picked this image for the cover because it really depicts life in, in our area. There were 28 dairy farms from Cottage Hill to Route 28 in the, uh, until the 20th century uh, dragged on and uh, they, one by one they kind of went out. So this was a dairy farm. This is me driving the calves back up to the barn to to feed them their calf starter. Interesting story here. This is Goldie the bull, worthless as a stud bull. <laughs> the farmer actually couldn't bear to get rid of him. He was such a friendly bull. It was really usually you, you could go over and pet him. And when they needed a bull for stud, they'd have to borrow one from another farmer. But this is Goldie looking on protectively over the calves as they come up. 15 years later, this is this is what it looked like. Everything was overgrown. Farms were all gone by this time in the early 70s, most of the dairy farms were going out. And now I couldn't bring myself to take a now picture because this is all gone. All these buildings are, are gone. This is part of the world's largest collection of feed tags. This is the calf starter that I used to feed the, the uh, calves with. And these are 100 pound sacks. Farm kids end up being strong because you have to carry these 100 pound sacks. We used to sit on these sacks of feed in the back of a pickup truck, drive back from the feed store. You don't see that anymore. But uh, they, they were all from the Grange League Federation. And it was a, a cooperative that uh, produced products for, for dairy farmers. And uh, they were very successful. They used to hire farm boys. The, the girls had, uh, ended up not <laughs> doing that kind of work, but the uh, the employees that ran the business were all ex-farmers. Then they decided that they were gonna hire business administration graduates who had never been on a farm. And that was along with the, the uh, phasing out of dairy farms, that was the, the beginning, the end for the Grange League Federation. Now, if you've read the stories, uh, you'll recognize this as the tuberculosis scare of 1966 in Kingston High School. They tested everybody. I tried to get the original photos of this and they were gone. The people that produced the yearbook uh, used the photographs to do the yearbook and uh, it got lost after that. So I had to actually scan one out of the the, uh, the yearbook. Now, people think I have an incredible memory, but uh, truth be told, what I do is I go back and use all the resources I can to, to get the supportive detail and facts and, and also to uh, reaffirm my memory. So this was a front page story that Kingston Freeman uh, about that uh, tuberculosis scare that I referred to. Now, the uh, this, this was my stairway to heaven story. <laughs> The, the story that I got started with the uh, memoir, this would be a uh, a nightmare to get all the photo credit for. This is a 
uh, Photoshop uh, paste up of overlays that depict a lot of the elements in that story. Little things in here you recognize. This is these are a couple of gassy vacuum tubes glowing. If you went to a garage band performance in the 60s and looked in the back of the amplifiers, this is what you saw. So I tried to get things that would that would uh, elicit memories. And uh, this is he's the Dylan, this is the album that Dylan went electric on. It plays a part in the story. And here I am trying to decide at 16 years old whether I want to pay acoustic or electric and Guernsey cows walking around. And, and what's in the background here, this is a beautiful valley in back of my parents' house. And Rakita Brook flows through here before the power lines came through and before the pastures grew up. It was just such a bucolic scene. I use that for a backdrop. Now, in the case of Blood, Beer, and Gasoline, a memoir, if you've read that, you'll kind of recognize this scene. I couldn't find any photographs of it. Nobody was taking photographs at 2 o'clock in the morning in pitch black. So I had to use my meager artistic uh, skills and, and sketch a scene myself of uh, this young man that managed to hang his car by the rear bumper from the wires upside down and, and uh, almost died in this scene. And here's the, the blood and the beer bottles in the street and the gasoline you don't see is flowing through the car and over the sparking battery under the compartment of the engine. So this I was saying there's story centric memoirs about it, these unbelievable scenes. This is from the story of the reservoir. One of the, my favorite places in the world as a young person, as it was for many people. I was lucky to get this photograph one August day. I understand the New York Times sent a photographer up to try to catch this, but it takes us just the right circumstances for somebody to climb up to this 85 foot ledge and jump off. And this guy you see is sailing down. He still has to clear about 20 or 30 feet of of uh, distance over the, the lip of the falls and then there's rocks in the water underneath this too. He didn't die. One, one of the things that's interesting about that, I put this picture up on Facebook and I've seen it in derivative works with creative captions. People say it's May Day, not May. These people are obviously not sitting around there in, in May. <laughs> but once you put something up on Facebook, there's no telling what's gonna happen with it. This is the same ledge a few months later with the water flowing over that water coming down through the spillway bridge. This is where the picnicking happened. It was a beautiful space. It used to be up there. It's still beautiful, but it used to be more beautiful in my youth. These were the aerators, the way they looked uh, uh, back in the in the day. And uh, what I found over and over again is when I put up these stories, I get the uh, responses from people who have had uh, some kind of a connection with the story. Yeah, here's my friend Rod who said uh, his friend's brother died in the spillway on a different day. Uh, that I was happened to be there the day they closed up the, the spillway falls because two people died the same day. And another friend of mine happened to be the EMT that uh, was in the ambulance that attended to the to the victim in the hospital. And other people say, yeah, they love swimming. So it's, it's just so great to see these other uh, memoirs, little, little uh, remembrances of, of that. Now, this is where the spillway was. It's been closed up for so long, most people don't know where it is, but the, uh, the runoff over the spillway comes down here. And to digress a little bit, uh, this is right near where the spillway post office was. How many people knew that there was a spillway post office? For three years, right after the completion of the spillway, there was a thought that there would be a lot of settlement and development in this area from the displaced people from uh, Ashton and uh, uh, Glenford and West Hurley, Brown Station, these people were all displaced. Most of them moved up around Route 28 from here and, and people didn't tend to settle down here. So the post office only lasted three years. Thanks to Jim Decker from the Hurley Historian's Office, this is the only known picture of that post office that exists. Later, later on, it became the Red Vest Inn. One of my favorite memoirs is the story of Abner. 
And I ha have to really commend Ruth Ann Mueller. When I wrote this memoir about uh, uh, this Olive Bridge story, this is uh, Reverend Harlan Kishpaw's beloved pet dog, Abner. He used to give him a shopping list, Abner go to the general store, come back with the groceries and the expense would get put on his, his account. I called up to make sure I had all the names and dates right. And, and Ruth then said, well, that's a nice story if it's true. I said, well, it is true because I have, my, my father took a picture, I saw it myself. And then I, so that, that's really the right kind of uh, skepticism, a healthy uh, challenging of uh, stories. And I, th I think that's really a, a good uh, approach for historians. And the first thing, time you hear a really uh, interesting story is uh, question it. Now, the Reverend Harlan Kishpaw is a story in itself that needs to be written up someday. This is uh, Harlan, and here he is listening to cylinder records with my father in his little studio. And this is a color picture of him. This is a sewer pipe cylinder, which is very scarce. Edison experimented with this. It's the size of a, of a sewer pipe, and uh, they're very rare. All these records on the wall are, are, are very rare, too. But, uh, he was a musicologist and uh, lived in Olive Bridge. This is him with his beloved dog, Abner. So these are all supplemental photos uh, to, this, to the story, uh, Abner the Shopping Dog. Now notice here, GLF motor oil, <laughs> the days of the Grange League Federation products. Uh, this was the front of the Grange Hall, believe it or not, with all these tanks and cylinders and cans of oil laying around, but uh, that's the way it was. Now, Johnny Kaufman, what, what a person he was. This is a story about Hurley Hay, and it's a tribute to Johnny Kaufman. I, I had a really hard time getting images of, of Johnny. But this is a good one. And uh, you'd be surprised if very few people know how this got here. Johnny Kaufman dragged it off of Keter Brook. This used to be a bridge over the, uh, the brook for the old Ulster and Delaware Stone Plank Tollway. There were two of these, one next to the other for the uh, wagons to go across the brook. The other one is broken, but this one remained intact. Is the sound on now? How to, okay, you're back. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what happened there. But uh, but 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 any rate. Uh, now the uh, story of Fort Dead in Ohio. This is the uh, Social Science Club, Ulster County Community College. Uh, we lost your screen share, so something happened with that. Uh, let's see. How do I do that? So make sure what you want to share is on your screen, then click the uh, green share screen button on the bottom of your Zoom window to bring it back. Are we back? Uh, Do we have? Looks, I, we don't see the screen share. It looks like you start, you've initiated the sharing. Oh, there it is. Now it's in. Okay. So this is the, uh, Social Science Club 1968, Ulster County Community College is me on the right here. We're really lucky to have really active uh, faculty members as advisors. And one of our club members uh, was Cindy Cobb. She was confined to a wheelchair. She's in the center. And here's Cindy again. This is me. And we're all taking an exam, apparently, in Ulster County. <laughs> and we recruited uh, for our organization by sending around a uh, little sandwich sign guy. If you have a thing, come do it. That was a popular expression back in the day. It's your thing, do what you want to do. I can't tell you who to sock it to. So it was a different time. <laughs> this is a student government president with a, a drill helmet on insert from uh, one of the guys that dropped out of uh, 
West Point uh, gave me this uh, this helmet, and uh, the president was wearing it as part of it. Now, I'll try to wrap up here quick. This is uh, Cindy Cobb. We carried her up in a sedan chair to the top of Overlook Mountain. And there were enough of us that we had to, uh, people to hold these rails and carried her up that steep slope. And this is me leading Alistair, the goat, who came with the expedition. And she was just so, 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 uh, so uh, exhilarated by this. This is our uh, <laughs> department chair and Harry Matson, who really uh, encouraged dissent and uh, and nonconformity, as you can see by his outfit here. But uh, now, I have a, a list of subjects that I intend to write a memoir on, and uh, a lot of them are waiting to find good images. A lot of them are waiting for me to get around to them. Uh, I, barbed wire is a story. The uh, former town supervisor, Gary uh, Bellows, tells this story every time he introduces me to somebody about how we used to toboggan underneath a uh, barbed wire fence by leaning down and just use inches above our face as we zip by. I want to write a memoir about Jim Bergwer, who's just a, a really wonderful. Uh, uh, his story, and he was an uh, anthropologist that did a lot of uh, research in this area. Uh, on the road to California, I'll explain that a little bit. Uh, and uh, but at any rate, you may see these. And if if you want to put in the chat which ones you want me to prioritize, if you see something here, go at it. Now, the trip to California is a story that is captured in this journal that my mother's sister kept when they drove from, in 1929, from Queens, New York City to Riverside, California. And she was a really good uh, uh, journalist in this way. She kept this journal. Their expenses each day on their way was never 20 bucks. It was usually like this, $15. That's gas, food, logic. <laughs> gas was, uh, about 20 cents a gallon. And uh, it is just an uh, incredible uh, story that it needs to be told. This is uh, my mother, my grandfather, and their 1928 Nash out in Utah on their way to California. I also want to write up a story about uh, Silver Thursday. I uh, was going to work for Harry McNamara and uh, Neil Siegel in their colonial stamp and coin business because they had so many people coming in for silver. But by the time I got a chance. The hunts had gone broke and silver crashed, so never got a chance. Let's see uh, another news article about that. Uh, I want to write up a story about Limburger cheese and logging chains to, as a tribute to my father-in-law. He and I love to do things together. Sadly, can't find a piece of Limburger cheese in Ulster County anymore. If somebody knows where they are, just send me a note. Used to be able to buy in the convenience store, but it's Going. This is Jim Bergraff when he was doing his digs. He, we had him come to my family home. Here he is uh, explaining to us uh, what he had uh, uh, discovered in uh, the uh, Long Hurley Avenue there where the uh, Lene Lenape had their long houses. My grandma and mother, Gary, Jackie Johnson, my father, my high school girlfriend. Just spellbinding story. So we had him come. Social Science Club again arranged to have him come talk at the Ulster County Community College, and uh, this is the story of, uh, of, uh, of Jim needs to be told. I, he used to come and visit our house every day, just about on his way home from work. He checked to see what my father turned up in the shop, and so this is a a, a scene from uh, our backyard where I'm working with stone. So I'm going to write a story about stoneworks. Having grown up along the old stone plank highway on 28, I did a lot of uh, work with salvage blue stone. So now, if you haven't read all my stories or any of my stories, I could provide Google Drive access to a repository where all these are. 
these sort of like album covers. These are the 63 memoirs I've written to date. And uh, they're up there in PDF form. And not too worried about people taking them and publishing their own book. If they do have at it, I'd love to have a, a wider audience for my stories. And uh, if I have to go to a self-publishing process to do that, it's going to cost me a lot of money. <laughs> so uh, the, the stories are here for his, the historical record, for historians to use and for friends to enjoy, and for my family to, to uh, understand what the family memorabilia is all about. So uh, that's the uh, that's the sequence of of images here, and uh, I'll turn it back now to Jeff, and I guess he has some some questions for me. Or okay, thanks thanks Bruce. Um, is there by any chance, uh, and I'm springing this on you because I wasn't exactly sure of how this was going to. Um, unfold uh but it, uh, you do you have an example from one of your memoirs that you could read briefly to us or uh which one would you like well which one speaks to to you i know from talking to you that you kind of like the one about the scooter on oh. uh, <laughs> is that one or uh, you know one of your of your choice uh, you know the scooter one okay Let's see if i can find that in my uh, my google drive here it, it's called the uh, eagle's nest plunge and uh, see I, i'll take a passage out of it This is the uh, kind of the conclusion of the story, but I said, because I crashed this little scooter at, at five years old, going down Eagle's Nest Road, which is really steep. And uh, I say here, uh, I, I do not remember if I consciously steered off the road to end the misadventure or if the laws of physics simply took over. I flew off the outside of the curve and into a bramble thicket. I ended up lodged so far into the prickly tangle that I could not move. I had numerous bloody scratches and ripped clothes from the thorns. There were only a half a dozen families on the road, so no passerby came to my rescue. No houses were within range to hear my cries for help. I slowly worked my way out to the road, trying to limit the number of new scratches. I left the scooter in the brambles and limped down to the Kniff's home. My mom was distressed when she saw my battered limbs, but didn't seem particularly surprised that I would attempt such a stunt. <laughs> I never saw that scooter again. I had a second scooter from even younger days, and it disappeared too. In fact, scooters were never again discussed in our household. And then after that, my uh, son has an epilogue. He's a uh, astrophysical simulator. He has 43.7 followers for his simulations on youtube that he does and uh, so he did a simulation of exactly how fast i was going he, he estimated that i was going 30 miles an hour at the onset 30 yeah 30, 30 miles an hour and uh, within a few seconds i was going so fast when i started out i couldn't stop so and i didn't know what i was doing i came from long island where everything is flat and i had to push myself along but so that's one of the uh, one of the popular stories. I always ask people what they like the best, and this is one of the ones they like the best. A lot of the ones that are more spiritual are are, are favorites with people. Uh, uh, the point in time is certainly uh, has a spiritual element. And uh, week on High Peak, I went up there to think about what I wanted to do with my life for a week, and that, that's kind of spiritual. But uh, this one is kind of exciting and has that little simulation at the end. Great, thanks. Um, I was, you know, the first one that I looked at, just picking up the book and opening it up at random, was one where I realized the two of us, even though we never met before we started talking about this thing, we were both in uh, the 
elephant to hear oh, Brian yeah. McGee and Sonny Terry, if oh, not the same night, the same weekend, and um, uh, just by chance. You know, it's uncanny. So, Some of my other friends, I didn't you know. There were three days that in, that, that gig. And yeah. so my other friends were there, and I guess they must have all gone different days. But people can't believe it when the, I say I, I sat down at a table with Brian and McGee and Sonny and Terry and had a bowl of chili after a gig in Woodstock. And really? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sonny Terry was uh, my introduction to folk music in certain ways. There were several, but he was one of them because he played a house servant in the original production of Finian's Rainbow on Broadway. And my sister got the full cast album. She was four years older than me. I must have been around eight or so. And the first cut on the album is Sonny Terry wailing on the harmonica. And it was just one of those sounds that just riveted me. Uh, it was so, so great. So I couldn't wait to go there. And then I had the same conclusion that I came to the same conclusion that you did is where is everybody? Here are these two people playing in Woodstock. Where is everybody? Now, I was just new to the area, so I didn't know, but I thought that, you know, the home of Al Grossman and Happy and Artie Trown, you'd have a ton of people in the audience to hear these, you know, these icons of uh, folk blues, but it didn't work out that, that way. So, you know, there's just a lot that popped up that was really nice, and I'm sure it does for other people, too. Can I show you the poster? Uh, I was there Sunday, and I, I asked the... Uh... The owner, if I could take the poster down because they were that was their final night, is sure take it. So I still have the, the poster from that gig. I noticed it ha hanging on your wall. <laughs> Do you have it ha ha handy here or uh... no? No, it's it's down in the, the <laughs> yeah, record so wall. Why don't we turn it uh, open it up to the audience if you have anything that you want to uh, say there's if you look down at the bottom of your thing you should see a place that says re reactions. <clears throat> so if you want to, uh, if you click on reactions you'll see the little si symbol to raise your hand. Um, so that's one way to do it to get Karen's attention, and another way is just to raise your hand. But, um, is there anyone that wants to <clears throat> join in the conversation? Okay, I see David. Uh, I need you. Yeah, uh, um, I had gotten Bruce's book uh, just before I left for um, Japan in September. And while I was there, I read the book and I thought it was one of the most fascinating things that I have ever read. And they were all things that I didn't know about Bruce. Of course, I didn't know him younger. book is absolutely fantastic and i thank you for writing it bruce you're welcome brockport someone had to sign up brockport uh, Carl, uh, go ahead, Carl. The hi, Bruce. This is Carl. Um, hi, Carl. I'm up in Vermont at the moment, but uh, I've had a chance to only read a, a few of your stories, and I'm going to read them all. But I was wondering how many you wrote about your experiences at IBM. I find a lot of people, when they talk about their histories and their memoirs, it starts before they got to IBM. And then it stops and then picks up after they left. <laughs> um, and, and, and there's this feeling that, well, you know, I spent 30 plus years someplace, but nobody's really interested in any of that. But I think there's some stories to be told there, and, and also by some of the people who are on listening. And I was wondering what you thought about that. Well, I remember sitting with you and Vicki Greenberg at, for lunch, and we were chatting and 
I was telling some stories and you and Vicky said, you should write a book and you should call it Tales from the from Big Blue. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a good idea, but I have a lot of crazy stories from outside IBM, but there are, there, there's some. Uh, one is the uh, fingernail pairings or perilous pairings. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that one where uh, there was a computer operator who kept ignoring me. They, they, they told her that if she keeps trimming her fingernails over the console keyboard, it's gonna take the whole system down. <laughs> I got called one day that the system was down and it happened to be the system that the uh, IBM vice president was on. So there was, the, the console was surrounded by all these IS managers waiting for me to fix it. And I took a pair of tweezers, pair of tweezers and held up the tweezers with the, her fingernail pairing in it and the polish matched what she had on. <laughs> and another one about the quitting time where uh, a department of uh, field engineers that I worked with uh, just decided at four o'clock to have a barbecue that afternoon and it just magically happened and we, the, the 15 of us got a half keg of beer and we finished that after work and uh, there's another story about engineers about how uh, when I was in the graphic systems we had this huge big uh, video display in the demo room to demo our engineering design systems to Boeing and GM and everything so I talked to uh, executive management to letting me set up a Lionel train in the demo room. And they had a, what they called a rail scope out. It was a brand new product from Lionel that had a little video camera. And this is before GoPro and, and all that sort of stuff. And I connected the video output from this locomotive running around the demo room for the Christmas party we had up to this huge big video display. And it was just so much fun seeing all these engineers and programmers getting down on the floor so they could see themselves up on this big screen with this <laughs> Lionel train coming around. So there, there, there have been a lot of interesting experiences uh, from IBM. So you were, you and Vicky were part of the encouragement for me to start doing this. Oh. Thank you for that. I didn't realize that, but you're welcome. There must be other questions. There's a there's a hand up with uh, Jackie, Jackie Johnson. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's Gary. Gary and Jackie Johnson. Can can you hear me, Bruce? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Hi. I was just I I, I I always looked at your I looked all through your memoirs. And one of the things that I saw that was missing was that clock you built in your bedroom <laughs> where I always had a I always had a pickup truck and Jack, uh, Bruce's dad, he got packages and things like that and things grew up around the house. So I'd come down periodically and Bruce and I would go to the Ulster County landfill, which wasn't the Ulster County landfill, then it was a dump. And there was a section. So we would take all the stuff that his dad and mom and Bruce had discarded, and we'd go off to the uh, Ulster County landfill, and we'd discard the uh, whatever it was to get rid of. But the most important part of the entire trip was not discarding, it was receiving. Because the Ulster County landfill had a giant electronic deposit area. And at that time, it was over behind uh, one of the malls that's in Kingston now, and it was quite a big pile. So Bruce built this clock, which, which he told me was, the purpose was to re remind him of things like mundane things like his grandmother's birthday and not let him forget and not let him have to concentrate on it. So this thing was ticking away in his bedroom and it was all built out of spare parts. So we would go over to the electronics part and we would refill my truck with all the things that Bruce felt he needed to further his clock exploration. And, but I would often come home with more, more weight, certainly, than I went with to the dam, to, to the dump with. And it was always, it, it always reminded me of 
Whenever I think of Bruce, I think of his bedroom and he had a bench there that was just full of all these diodes, electrons, all these things that at the time were like cutting edge that he would unsolder and then re-solder to make his clock out of. It was, just, it, was a, it was just a great thing to be part of, which I didn't understand anything of. So anyway, there you go. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta do something about the clock, Bruce. <laughs> have to put that on the list. Yeah, it was really fun. And the funny thing is when I, I had an EIA equipment rack, a six foot high rack to put the, uh, you know, build the electronic components in. When I carried that in the front door, a light bulb burned out coincidentally in the living room. And my mother to her dying day believes that because I carried this empty electronic equipment rack in the house that it caused her light. Yeah. Yeah, Lowell had his hands up. Oh, uh, Bruce, maybe- um, Hi, Lowell. Possibly you could tell us a little bit about your family's connection to Olana and the dinner you had there oh. in the tower. <clears throat> yeah, Gary and Jackie are, are part of that story. Uh, we got a call in our, we used to buy contents of houses in the States in our, our business. We got a call one day to go up to uh, Columbia County and look at a house to buy. And the, the deal was that they wanted to sell the house and contents together, which was a little bit different for us because we used to just buy the contents of the states. And uh, it was Olana. And I, I, was, I was taken along because I, I was always brought along to, to do the heavy lifting and, and, and carry furniture with my father and load up the truck. So I went along, I'm going through the, the, the house, which is Olana. And I saw the, the plaster falling off the lath and the house was you know, had a leaky roof. And I'm thinking, are we gonna have to live here if we buy this house? We, we couldn't afford to, that was, two houses. <laughs> so, but by the time my father went and got it, he had to get a mortgage to buy the, uh, the whole estate and contents. And by the time he did that, the, uh, there was a grassroots effort to preserve the, uh, the site and keep it from being developed. So we, we lost out on a lot of that in that regard, but we always had a love for it. And there was a charity auction to uh, raise some money to preserve the, uh, the building. And uh, my father decided that he was going to win that auction for dinner for eight in the bell tower of Olana. So, my, my wife and I were, well, at the time we were engaged, she was my fiance, we were to be married the next week. So it was kind of a prenuptial dinner. So my wife and I, my parents, Gary, G Jackie Johnson and Gary and Arlette Johnson uh, uh, had this dinner for eight in this beautiful evening in the bell tower. And uh, we also later on found some watch papers from uh, Fred Church's uh, father and uh, we donated them to the, uh, the site for their collection. And then when I wrote this memoir, I, I always like to get this, the, the, the facts straight. So we sent a proof copy, a draft copy to, uh, to the site and had the, uh, the site director and a curator look it over and uh, change some of the wording, make sure we had things right. And they gave us a VIP tour and a, uh, trip up to the bell tower, which is closed now. So we got a chance to go up there and see the, the tower. So that was another benefit of writing memoir. We got a chance to go up and uh, revisit Olana. But uh, just to have had the chance to possibly buy Olana, it was a $250,000 price that was being asked. Can you believe that? $250,000, 1963, I was, I think it was. And uh, it's a good thing we didn't buy it because it, we couldn't afford to preserve it as a historic site. Uh, we would we would had to have uh, sold off the contents and then sold the house and it wouldn't be what it is today. So it's kind of fortunate that, uh, that my father had to go get that mortgage and it took enough time that uh, 
the, the sale was stopped. But it's kind of a Thank you. Story. Jane, we can bring you in. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Bruce and everyone. Oh, hi, Jane. Uh, thanks so much for all you shared. Um, it was our joy to work on the project with Bruce. We found it very inspiring and exciting. And um, one little thing I want you to think about for a future um, memoir, it has to be exciting to have twin boys. And um, there is no story that I've read yet about some of the adventures of having two twin boys. So well, that's um, a good point. <laughs> it would be it fun is. to. There are hear, lots of stories. Hear a bit about your early family life. And our 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 boys were were uh, were very mischievous sometimes. So there might be some stories there. <laughs> I'm sure there are some good ones. I'll have to uh, give them a chance to review the draft. <laughs> yeah, they said in the chat that they get veto power. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, did they say that? Yeah, uh, I guess Andrew is here. And um, yeah. Yeah, there are. Actually, there was. I, I don't know if it's on the list, but uh, I took a year off of work to be with the boys when they were just uh, preschool age. And uh, it was it beginning school, but uh, there were a lot of interesting things that happened that year that uh, I took off from work to spend time with them. I'll, I'll save the, uh, the the details to uh, increase the uh, ex 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 excitement in the story. <laughs> uh, Bradley in the chat said, uh, on the other hand, he has nothing to hide. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jane, I really need to thank you because you uh, really were uh, the, the impetus for putting the, the book together. It was your idea to, to, to create the, the book, to compile all the stories into a book. And it's been a big encouragement to me. And the, uh, like I had mentioned before, the responses of people are just so heartwarming. Uh, my uh, doctors believe that that's why I'm doing so well. <laughs> uh, there was a, uh, a question in the chat from a little while back from uh, Troy Ellen Dixon, who asks, uh, while you were at IBM, did you have any thoughts about DEC or was that completely off your radar? Uh, DEC, you mean Department of Environmental Conservation? No, DEC, DEC, the computer make, maker. Oh, DEC, uh, DEC, DEC Computers, Digital Equipment Corporation. Is that yeah. the question? Yeah. Yeah, she confirmed that Digital Equipment Corporation. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I saw Chester Hartwell holding up a sign that said Brockport. And my first experience with Digital Equipment Corporation was at Brockport. I had an assistantship wiring a, uh, it was an automated data collection system for an experiment. The truth is the professor wanted to build a computer to play chess. So he wrote, a, a, <laughs> wrote up a proposal for a study that required a, a system that would, would be modifiable after the experimental uh, project was over to, to play chess. And I built it for him. And I got a lot of experience with the digital equipment parts there uh, from DEC. Uh, they were a competitor. Uh, uh, one of my uh, classmates ended up being a chief scientist for Digital Equipment Corporation. That's a twin story. The, the, the Drucker twins both ended up uh, going to the same college, majoring the same thing, applied at the same places. They both went to Digital Equipment Corporation. And when one ended up becoming chief, you can only have one chief scientist in a corporation. So one became chief scientist, the other you know, quit and started Compaq. So uh, you have some experience with uh, with the Digital Equipment Corporation. Sounds like another story. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to be a little bit careful with uh, living persons. 
And uh, so I like to check stories with them. Uh, the... uh, looks like Andrew has his hand raised. Um, where did you go, Andrew? By the host. Yeah. There you go. Oh, so I, I think a twin story that uh, the readers might enjoy is the one where dad secretly taught Brad and I how to swim without mom's knowledge and then threw us into the pool like spears right in front of her. That was a, that would be a good one. <laughs> I, that was in my mind. I intend to do that one. That'll certainly be a, a key element of the story that it'll be uh, reinforced with, with some others too. But uh, that that certainly was a lot of fun. Yeah, my, yeah. Andrew Bradley's mother did not know that they knew how to swim at all, and I taught them to swim that summer. And uh, we, we demonstrated to Gail by, like Andrew said, throwing him into the pool like a spirit. He just disappeared under the surface, and uh, Gail knew I wouldn't endanger my my sons like that but i think she was probably pretty ex pretty uh excited uh hildegard did you want to come in oh thank you so much i've so enjoyed this and thank you for spurring me on to do, to do some of my own my own writing but uh about 50 years ago when i first came to this area a woman, I would say probably in the Hurley uh, roundout, uh, uh, not roundout, but in out in the Hurley area, wrote a book, I think, I think she just called it Tales from Grandma or something, but she was interviewed on the radio. Unlike you, her stories were not event, so much specific event oriented, but rather, how she remembered doing things or some special experiences of her childhood and writing them expressly for her grandchildren. I don't remember the name exactly, but Schoonmaker was one of the surnames she used. She used her maiden name and her uh, married name. Mary Manny Schoonmaker somehow fits in my brain, but you know how unreliable one gets at a certain age. Um, but they were delightful. And now that I'm doing archival work for Friends of Historic Kingston, I'm thinking about it and saying, I hope that book, a copy of it, because she did have it privately printed and I bought my copy at O'Reilly's. Um, uh, I, I hope it's found its way into certain archives because it in, it, in his way, like yours, is very valuable. Yeah, these, these, these things are going to be a resource. I've been uh, giving copies to town historians and uh, some local libraries and uh, hopefully uh, it'll, it'll outlast me. Uh, Wayne, you can unmute. Is that me? There you go. I'm on. So, so um, if you Google Bruce Wistens, IBM okay. oral history, you will come up with a very good interview Bruce did about 30 years ago when they were compiling an oral history of IBM in Kingston. So if you like to, to snoop around the internet, that's a good one. And, uh, and he, it was probably a, a 20 minute interview with a, a gal. Do you remember that, Bruce? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oral it wasn't history. 30 years ago. The Friends of Historic Kingston did a project, the IBM years. Yeah, the IBM years. years. So that's like still I, that's still on uh, on the internet. So it'll be there probably in the next hundred years. And uh, the other good one I was always impressed with when you when you became a civil engineer, uh, self trained civil engineer surveyor, and and replatted the 30 acres you bought behind the house and, and how you found the extra land that wasn't on the tax rolls. And I, I just remember seeing like a map after map after overlay after overlay to bring your case to the county that uh, I should take over this land. I, you know, I'm not paying taxes on land I don't own. You know, so that was, that, that was a great. 
I wasn't a civil engineer. I was a uh, uh, developer of engineering design systems for geophysical information systems. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so I was used to doing uh, uh, 2D, 3D transformations and things and, and coding that. And so I coded that all up mm -hmm. and, and plotted all the town boundaries and all the deed boundaries. And there's a, uh, a magnetic, magnetic deviation that occurs, a cycle yeah. that changes. I had all that programmed in there and uh, took it to a, uh, a county, Ulster County meeting of uh, the county treasurer and the real property tax people and and uh, the, uh, the the group uh, was finally convinced that uh, this, uh, I had already bought this land. <laughs> yeah. And that's the view that, that you see this uh, view behind me. That's uh, what you see standing on that land that uh, I ended up uh, uh, per prevailing in the demonstrating that I already owned it. <laughs> so the, I did have the, to pay some back taxes because yeah. uh, I learned from Ulster County that once taxes are billed, they must be paid. It doesn't matter who <laughs> pays it, doesn't matter who owns the land, but <laughs> those taxes will be paid. <laughs> By somebody. Yeah. 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 That was Enjoyed. Fun. It took two years actually doing yeah. research for that. And, and the other one is uh, you need to get Freddie Blue Fox in there somewhere because that was a big part of your your latter yeah. years. I have. And the demise of Freddie Blue enough, Fox. There, there are no memoirs written about our band days when we had a uh, band that we played for square dances, country dances. Uh, I do have on the list uh, a, a story. I ended up getting a concussion on stage getting nearly impaled with the the sharp point of a Earl Scruggs special banjo in the <laughs> dim light of the what we had to to play with it was a uh, flickering neon light in the window that was the light we had <laughs> and uh, we ended up colliding on stage and I had a uh, head a headstock on the banjo right to the temple here but, uh, the other interesting stories too from our band days. So, so how do you come up with the name uh, Fred? How did yeah. you come up with the name Freddie Blue Fox? Yeah. Uh, he was adopted by the Lakota tribe in North, uh, wherever the Dakota Indians are, North Dakota, South Dakota, South Dakota, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the name they gave him when he was adopted by the, the tribe. Oh, cool. Uh, Stephen, did you have a question? And I think a after Stephen, we might have uh, time for one more and then we'll have to uh, go into our closing. So, thank Stephen, you. Hi. Oh. That's, that's Stephen. Hi, Steve Kern. Not Stephen, yeah, that one. <laughs> hi, hi, Bruce. Thank you so much. This hi. is amazing. I mean, you, over the few years that we know each other, I think we met when we did the post office book and you gave us those amazing photographs and you've told us such great stories. Just a couple of little things. Um, the What Wayne had mentioned about the interviews, I think, and Lowell, I think, was working on that. Did, um, you might have together done that uh, with Friends of Historic Kingston, but that's actually on Friends of Historic Kingston's website. Very clearly, one can access those really interesting IBM interviews are very, all very well organized. Um, that would be the best way that if one wants to find those. And um, we're still have yet to finish because we're just getting our schedule cleared, Your the, the current printed memo, which we're looking forward to diving in, but I had no idea about the other memoirs and I would just love to request if you could do this again, you know, and, and give us more taste of all those memoirs. What, I mean, that's just incredible what we, what you showed us all those thumbnails and uh, with Jeffrey or however, we're happy also if, if you need, we can be happy to host a few um, and do this kind of session. Everyone is just, I know that I feel the vibe that everyone, um, 
I think here tonight could just hang another hour and listen to more and more stories. But right. anyway, that's all. Thank, wonderful. Thank you, Bruce. Hey, thanks, thanks, Steve. Well, I've actually been inspired by uh, your work. You're so such a prolific author. It's just astounding. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Any other hands up? I, I can only see just a few tiles, Karen, so I don't know. Are, are we all, all done, all in for now? Yes. <clears throat> Though I definitely agree with Stephen, we we could probably we should probably do one of these a week, and you can go <laughs> forth. But we'll, we'll save that talk for for another day. Well, I can tell you one thing that's uh, occurred to me. I now understand why serial programs have been so successful in in early radio and TV. Uh, I, I get a lot of feedback that people make their coffee in the morning and then bring up their computer to see this the Monday morning memoir because they are counting on being there each week. <laughs> There's something about that serial presentation that, that fits with the human psyche. Okay, great. I do see Brad's hand up and I, I can't let uh, a scout go before your son has a chance to ask I, you. I was, gonna, for twins <laughs> I was going to ask you later, but real quick, I, I never knew that there was a goat on the trip of the Ulster <laughs> County Community College Social Sciences Club up over the <laughs> mountain. Uh, I will have to ask more about that later, but yeah, this is the kind of thing you learn when you hear a story. Probably. I have a lot of uh, pictures from that day, and, and there is a movie of it, actually, and the, the, the movie camera belonged to our advisor, Steve Larson, and he was taking movies of the day because it was a, such a, a significant kind of a event. Somebody stole the movie camera while we were up there, and they triggered the uh, the motion picture camera to to record. They recorded themselves stealing the movie camera. <laughs> and we we were going so fast down the hill, we caught up with these people that stole his camera, and we took it back. And when he developed the film, he he saw them stealing his camera. So that was an interesting day. And then we came down that hill in a 1953 Dodge steak truck with, with bad brakes down uh, uh, from, uh, from, from Overlook Mountain. And I was driving. It did not have a synchro mesh transmission. And I was trying to slam it down into lower gears downshift to, to brake. <laughs> I was afraid that we were going to run off the road and kill the whole, the whole social science club, but uh, we all survived. <laughs> that that's an interesting story for me too, because my first time up to Overlook, uh, I was in my little two-cycle Saab, <laughs> and that had what they called free freewheeling. So you could you oh, yeah, really. if you were in freewheeling, you you couldn't use the. Uh, you know the downshifting, and I had the old the old pneumatic brakes, and I could get exactly two to three depressions of the brake pedal before I had no more brakes. And I was from Manhattan, so I was used to level ground, and I was going downhill, and I don't know how I reached the bottom in one in one piece, but uh, but that that. That was great, but um, okay. So I do have to wrap up now. I want to thank everyone for coming. <clears throat> I've seen a lot of old friends who I haven't spoken to in years, uh, uh, like Jackie Johnson, who I used to work with and did wonderful things for some of my concerts uh, with with the art in Marble Town School. Hildegard, I, I know from her work for me at the Rear Center. And also she was um, the Lamaze teacher when I was having kids. And she was our instructor for that. And Lowell uh, has been an inspiration to me for many years and Stephen and uh, Karen and Henry too. So I mean, there are a lot, and those are just the people I can see here. I know that in the other 50, there are more. So. I thank you, Bruce. It's been a de delightful evening. My and pleasure.
you brought a de delightful crowd to the table. So uh, thanks again. And uh, we'll be back in 2023, God forbid. And uh, so uh, we'll see you then. Thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, coming, everyone.